and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from DS Ex Machina, creator of a, lo a lot of things that has been covered on this channel in one form or another, and now coming back with a backer kit version of Ultra Modern 5 Redux, as well as a bunch of campaigns for it, which we'll be, get which we'll be getting into today, the one and only Chris Diaz. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. Open bar. Where's my gin and tonic? <laughs> uh, you know, one one of these days, one of these days, I want to see, I want to um, have somebody ask for gin and tonic, and then I say, okay, you got to flip a coin. If it lands heads, you get gin. You if it tails, you get tonic. Mm-hmm. Well, I can make it work. Yeah. Now, um, just to see if, of course, what they don't know is that the coin has two heads on it. Aha! Uh -huh. One of those. Yeah, because. Well, GMs fudge the dice, so why shouldn't why shouldn't the bartender in that case? Exactly. Oh, although I although I do have I do have the rule that um anyone who's a anyone who's a Leafs fan has to has to has to pay an extra cover charge. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, if only if only because that if only because that team's been my whipping boy for most of my life. Hmm. Then again, then again, they're the then again, based on what I hear, they're the whipping boy of the rest of Canada because <laughs> constantly acting like they're Canada's team and not doing anything, about, and and not having anything to show for it for about fifty three years. Yeah. But moving pe moving past that, we have talked we have talked about ultra modern in the past, but at that time I was kind of doing a broad brush where I was trying to dip into. A little, a little bit of, a little bit of am, a little bit of amethyst, a little bit of ultra modern, a little bit of a of apex, and a little bit of the, um, of the of the early days. So, I suppose the, I suppose the fir the um the first the first thing was would be. Now, as I as I understand it, Ultra Modern has been Ultra Modern has been a, has been a thing for quite a bit. My first introduction was Ultra Modern Four, but that goes back a ways. Mm -hmm. But when it came but when it came to adapting Ultra Modern into into Fifth Edition, um, what would you say were some of the were some of the big challenges you had to overcome? Uh, what the big challenges? Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges. In adapting four to five was well, most of that got solved with that with the with amethyst quintessence because that was the test bed for ultra modern. So for me, it was trying to be faithful to what uh, the original ultra modern produced and also try to do things and interpret it in, in, into fifth edition. And the funny thing was, just like with fourth edition, there were a lot of people at the time saying, "Oh, it, it doesn't work. You can't you can't do a sci-fi or a non-fantasy with D and D. It's only for uh, fantasy." And I'm like, "Okay, we'll hold my beer." And then it went on from there. And in my experience, a lot of the folk who do, who make the claim of "oh, it can only be used for fantasy" um, have a very limited view of fantasy. Just my experience on the matter. Yeah, and obviously they've been. I've, they've, everyone's been in that capacity has been proven wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but I'd, I'd imagine that I imagine that one of the bigger challenges is. How is how to handle not having any any equivalent to spells when tr when trying to take a fantasy system and tr and do mo do modern slash SF with it? Yeah, well, the, the, it was the the thing that's particularly important is when I was adapting ultra fourth edition for people who who uh, can't remember the details was very much very much dealt with roles. So a fighter would be a tank. He would have marking abilities. He his capacity was to try to draw the attention from the from the controllers and the support people, which didn't have as many hit points. So there were specific roles. There was a tank. There was a a striker, a support controller, and so forth. So these were specific roles. 
when I moved into Ultramodern 4, I gave each class two different builds, support and so forth. When I translated to 5th edition, instead of trying to turn 5th edition into Ultramodern, I tried to turn Ultramodern into 5th edition, so I kept those ideas. So I kept the idea of the fact that uh, the heavy class is not designed uh, wholly to just inflict maximum damage on singular targets. And he would be more the support. This would be a ranged, um, basically a, a, a ranged spellcaster that dropped down area effects that slowed or impeded or damaged foes. Which is basically what a, what a, what a spellcaster does. He didn't have spells, he didn't have fancy, he didn't have studying. He just had this ability of laying down these areas and these and these overwatch, basically try to impede the enemy movement much the same way the, wi the, the wizard does. Mm -hmm. So he fills that role. When we got to the medic, I decided to replicate that fancy and magic system, but turn it into medical exploits. So we, we kind of still employed that. So in some situations, we're taking that spell crafting system apart and we're trying to disperse it to different classes, so a lot of that still happens. Like, you're still not, you're still not going to get a Meteor Swarm. You're still not going to get a Disintegration spell, unless you have a, like, like a, a weapon that does that type of damage and you just shoot it. But And we, and we don't have some of the mind-altering, like you can't modify memory with any of the base classes. So some of the obvious ones aren't, aren't there. But we also have a lot more stuff around combat. There's a lot more leadership-based, a lot more role-playing-based. Both the civilian and the face are both classes that don't have primary combat powers. So it's designed for those games where talking and role-playing and figuring out situations that don't involve attack dice, that comes into play. Mm -hmm. And I will admit one thing I, I enjoy with the approach you t that's taken with with Ultramodern is um, divorcing the idea of sub of subclasses at being linked to classes which is one of the, which is one of those things that's cute in 5e but it does lead to a future proofing problem and did you notice did you take a look at the new rules by the way um with I'm the playtest rules that uh, that D&D was putting out and then has kind of stopped since then I did. I I remember having a whole ass rant about about se about several several of them. One of them, in, one in particular, was how they handled the warlock. Hmm. Um, I don't like. I feel. I feel like what they were doing kind of missed the point. Because hmm. I'm not sure if you saw it, but the the reason why is they made they made warlocks half casters. Mm -hmm. They. However, however, because of that, they in addition they don't get their spells back after a short rest, and the and the um uh, the the auto upcast that's one that was one of the big um selling that's one of the big selling points with warlocks to balance out how how few spells that they have, mm -hmm. that's gone. Like they 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 took they took the warlock which had its own, which had its own niche. And just made it another half caster, right? Like uh, for me, the one thing I noticed when I was looking through those rules was uh, the fact that it looked like they were doing exactly the same thing. They were divorcing uh, the archetypes from the core classes, mm -hmm. uh, and that was something I did. It it, it is fascinating, uh, and pe people do. I mean, there are people that that make that observation that a lot of the ideas that I introduce in some of my books just end up pop, you know, popping up in first party books. And uh, that's just how it is, you know, from the, when I took backgrounds, I split them into a massive life path system. And then that exact same life path system uh, showed up in um, Xanthar's Guide of Everything. Uh, the fact that in Ultra Modern, we split the archetypes so they were not class specific and then gave the archetypes at, at the exact same level for every class so you can interchange them. And now with with the with the D and D one rules or five point five whatever you want to call them if it's ever happening, uh, they did exactly the same thing. They put the the, arch, the the archetypes at specific class at specific levels and then appear to divorce uh, archetype selection from that. Yeah. And it, it's it's fascinating. Uh, and it's not the first time. Probably won't be the last. But it is what it is. It is it is amusing. But what I've what I have noticed when it comes to those things being carried over is carried over, but not quite not quite understanding. Um, how to how to integrate it, mm. um, which is 
part which is part for the which is part for the course for some things like the way they ha the way they've handled say feats and feet and feet like abilities yeah um because the whole the whole reason feats were introduced was to introduce a degree of personalization to characters beyond your beyond your choice of class yeah and by re by restrict by restricting them to this alternate version of a of ASI, <laughs> the, the and then in, and then it's if they want to do that and that's fine, but then they end up introducing classes that are having feats in all but name, like yeah. say the evocations for um, warlocks. Again, again is one example, or e even the fighting styles for um, fighter. Yeah. Those those come, and the, and in all fairness, Pathfinder is just as guilty, if not more so, of the feats in all but name habit. Hmm. Like for for example, the fighter talents in um in Pathfinder. Yeah. But the but I, the vibe that the vibe that I get with what I've seen from the from one from the one D and D is trying to. Trying to trying to trying to simplify a lot of things, which a lot of people speculate is for the is for that um, virtual tabletop that they that they want to make. Actually, yeah, which is probably going to come out sometime next year. Probably going to come out sometime this year, but I'm not exactly confident in it because they want to put it on. They they they're using the Unreal Engine for it, and they want to put yep. it on consoles as well. Those are two things I don't think are the smartest idea. Yeah. Because by using the Unreal Engine, you're bottlenecking the kind of um, the kind of people you can get you can get on it. Since not everybody's yep. going to have a beefy ass PC, mm -hmm. and by putting it on consoles, well, if somebody if somebody wants to play a D and D like on a console, they'll pro they'll probably play they'll probably play Dragon Age or something. Yeah, exactly. There, um, and the the analogy I used is more people played StarCraft on P. Even though StarCraft was on the N64, it barely it barely made a dent compared to the PC audience. Hmm. Uh, I get most of the time when R when RTSs try to go on console, they don't they don't stick. Um, same with 4X games. It's just uh, that's not to say that you couldn't. I mean, Halo Wars is a is a good example of of it. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is. Um, Real-time strategy and grand st and 4x um, games are always going to be a PC fo um, focus kind of affair. Yeah. And the I look and um, when I when I looked at that as well as some of the other stuff that ha that happened over the last few months, um, I get the vibe of some of somebody not quite understanding the um, ecosystem that they stepped in. Yeah. Which is funny to me because remember all those times when people when people were yelling or people were yelling about about how fourth edition was turning D and D into an MMO. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I think all those people owe me an apology. <laughs> and the funny thing is that you saw what Pathfinder Second Edition was doing. Yeah. A lot of the same thing. And I don't. T and in, in all honesty, I don't take the. Um, they're turn they're turning blank into a video game argument because I heard that all the way back in two thousand with third edition. Yeah. Uh, it's it's like the they're dump it's like the they're they're casualizing it ar argument. It's 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 more of a boogeyman that should that shouldn't be taken seriously. But since you brought since you brought up the whole thing of 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 um la of life path, um. I am cu I'm curious what I'm curious what brought what brought in the idea for you to do a life path system within Ultra Modern. Well, primarily that came I mean that's the reason why I'm never terribly upset when when somebody takes out one of my ideas because basically you track it back far enough you'll eventually find somebody else that came out, came out with the idea first. Mm -hmm. And in my situation uh Artel Zorian uh, which was probably my favorite game company growing up because they did Cyberpunk and Mechton and all that. Hallowed be their name. Uh, Hallowed be their name. The the great Mike Pondsmith. Mm -hmm. And 
what ended up happening is uh, we were madly in love with their rollable and customizable life path system where you would roll for years, you would roll for friends and enemies. Uh, started off so with Mechton, Mechton Zeta boosted this, Cyberpunk 2020 boosted this. And I decided uh, when we were gaming that whenever we start a new game, everybody would go through this life path system. Even if we didn't use those rules, we would still use the life path system. So any game that we ever play, up to up to and including Amethyst, we would have everyone run through their life path system. So we so they got to either choose or roll, and so I knew who all their friends were, their enemies, their relationships. And some things get a little crazy, you know, like this guy was married six times and they all died really really badly. And we eventually got that. And I and I was as time went on, whenever we created a new game, we would do this system. I've always had to kind of twist it and uh, and pretzel it to make it work whatever whatever which with the setting i was using mm -hmm. so i decided you know what this is what i need to do i need to create my own that's official part of ultra modern so that i i don't that i don't have to have to keep on using the rtg system yeah, and uh so that and ultimately that's what it was uh i actually talked to the guy who wrote that life path system in asgard and uh, he was he was pretty adamant that there was nothing inspiring him and i'm like dude come on if you're not going to at least I didn't say this, but if you're not going to at least credit me, at least credit Mike Pondsmith, because we're all, we're all just basing, basing the idea off of him. But you're to say that there was no inspiration at all for the system, it was entirely original, I'm like, no, it's not. And someone asks me, hey, that, is that uh, Life Path System original? I'm like, no, of course not. I ripped off Mike, Mike, Mike Pondsmith. Everybody ripped off Mike Pondsmith in some capacity. Yeah. In my opinion, anyone who claims that an idea that they have is, com is completely 100% original is... I'm not. I'm not gonna say. I'm not gonna say full on full of crap. But um, they're they're um, buying. In, they're buying into their own their own hype. They didn't learn mm -hmm. the lesson from Scarface. Never get high on your own supply. Yeah. There you go. Oh, um, because on the on um, on the other hand, I I think part of the reason why Pondsmith's um, life path system was was um, was got used by got used by so many is because between between that and the other major life path system it was the more fair i guess and of course that other one is traveler <laughs> yeah which which i've never I, I i've always known the name traveler but i've never ever played it i ha i've played my fair share um i remember when i had when i did a review of the um second edition of mongoose's version and and having to rack my brain about how am I, how am I going to summarize Traveler's history of system jumping over the years in less than five minutes? Yeah, because <laughs> it's like it's like trying to summarize the same thing with um, RuneQuest. It's not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But the re the reason I bring it up is because Traveler's um, life path system is infamous for the fact that you can die during character creation. I uh, yeah, I that I've heard of. I've heard about the dying during yeah. I, that I, I, that's funny. I've heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, but in all in all fairness, it, to play devil's advocate with it, you don't have any any time you any time you add a year, you are taking that risk. But after you add the first year, you can bet you can back out at any time. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a push your luck. They've turned it into a push your luck game, which I find is hilarious because. Um, uh, if I was going to develop, a, I was always really upset when the board game role player came out, and they turned the creation of a character into the game itself. And I thought it'd be interesting to do a board game where the life path was the game, and you have to try to survive to a certain year, and it's a push your luck, and you're trying to create a more interesting life. It'd be really interesting to play with that and see how it worked. Mm -hmm. I've always described it as a game of chicken. Yeah. That being said, I don't agree with it. You, you should be able to make the character you want. But uh, I do. I can see the appeal of having a system where suddenly you die before you even get to the end of the character generation. Yeah, it has it has its place. I've always I've always argued that there's room to ha to have both. I mean, um, for the last couple of editions, Shadowrun has had its priority system and the option for freeform if you want to take it. Yeah. But when it when it comes to like. I'd like to pl I'd like to play a little bit of um, I guess I guess word or character association when it comes to the, when it comes to the classes to kind of to kind of get a feel for what their equivalent might be in um, in other forms of fiction. Mm. So and 
I will start with the civilian. Yeah. The civilian is oh god. There's no there's no it, it he is the plucky sidekick. There is no real class equivalent in any other system that I know. The creating an entirely um, non-combat, non-specialized skill set. I thought of the joke from The Last Boy Scout, which was an old film with Arnold Schwarzenegger that spoofed action films. And one character who was aware he was in an action film, and he thought he was the buddy. And because he was the buddy, he couldn't die. But then he realized that he was not the buddy, but the comedy sidekick. And that because he was a comedy sidekick, nothing he did would actually work out. But he at least had luck on his side, and the fact that he could, and very would very often would survive the most impossible odds. And that's basically what we ended up doing when I when I created the civilian was creating someone who who's literally turned luck into a character ability. That was something that I had not seen before. Uh, you're not at all useless. You're actually generally well talented, and you know things because you're actually most. Smart characters, most scientists, doctors are civilians. They're not characters that are specialized in combat use. So you can be really, really good at many, many things. Mm -hmm. uh, but your primary, your primary ability is this bag of dice that you use to enhance your luck. Mm -hmm. um, face. Uh, face is James Bond. Uh, but specifically, I want to add, he's specifically the Roger Moore, Sean Connery James Bond not the Pierce Brosnan, Timothy Dalton, uh, you know, later on Bonds. He's not a shoot first. You know, it's one of those situations where it's definitely the talking Bond, the suave, rather than the uh, the person that is more action orientated. Mm -hmm. So, next would be the grounder. Uh, grounder is your Hicks, your Hudson. You're, you're, those are the primary direct hitters from aliens, right? They have the pulse rifle. They know how to do their their business. They can set explosives if they want. They, they're multi-talented, but they are primary strikers. Mm -hmm. Gunslinger. Uh, Gunslinger was as close to doing the uh, uh, Graviton clerics from Equilibrium without being sued. Uh, <laughs> but we also made room to having your classic one-shot you know, or the double, you know, like I said, originally it was playing off of Gun Fu, mm -hmm. which is equilibrium, but we made sure that there were elements of the John Woo hard boiled action style in there. But as we went and developed it, we also wanted to give people room of creating the more realistic John Wick type gunplay, where it's one bullet and much more controlled. And so forth. And that, that was that was kind of the important thing. But it started off as being the equilibrium, you know, gun kind of thing. Although I, although any any time somebody played Gunslinger in any of my campaigns, I, w I always had a rule that any time a critic, any time they rolled critical, um, pigeons would sh would show up and fly. Yeah, you gotta have the pigeons. <laughs> that's that's not the same without the pigeons. Mm -hmm. uh, the heavy. Heavy is your Vasquez and Drake from Aliens. Big, big, big guns, slow moving, and you know laying down, they're the ones with flamethrowers you know lay down suppressing fire with the incinerators like that's what they do they lay down suppressing fire they lay down area effects mm -hmm. uh, they are not designed for single one-on-one -on -one combat duty uh, because they're very slow but they are great at controlling crowds yeah uh, the the joke i've always made whenever it comes to the heavy weapons guy is i've got a bullet with your name on it and i'm going to keep firing until i find it yeah <laughs> that's basically it yeah uh, especially since if you if you look at the if you look at the heavy archetype in a lot of um, hero shooters, they're always in the defense. They're always in the defensive um, archetype, not an offensive type. Yeah, which same, may seem contradictory because because they're usually ha hauling around a fucking minigun or a flamethrower, but it makes sense because their whole thing is sit their happy ass down in in one spot and make sure anyone who moves into moves into sight. Um, is not moving anymore. Yeah, and the funny thing is, is that when you deal up with the Gatling gun, which is another one of these kind of big area effect weapons, every time you ever see the Gatling gun ever used in a film, these miniguns, they're always used for suppression. You never see it being used on like one target very very seldomly, unless it's the bad guys shooting at the good guys. Mm -hmm. When it's the when it's the good guys, it's like Predator, it's like Terminator. It's it's area effects, it's suppression, it's it's area of denial. It's well, those things are really fucking heavy. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's become a situation where it's uh, the heavy is this wall that just slowly moves forward, claiming territory. Mm -hmm. um, infiltrator. Uh, that is the other half. That one is, like I said, part part James Bond, part assassin. Uh, oh, what would be a good? I'm trying to figure out because that one was me trying to create the more the more stealthy work, work, but I wasn't, I, I wasn't, one thing I wasn't thinking of, I wasn't thinking of Assassin's Creed. Um, it was probably closer to uh, Thief or other things, the non-magical, mm -hmm. you know, but the Infiltrator is basically taking the Assassin, taking the stealth capacity of the, of the rogue without the, uh, without the thieving and the ro roguishness. It's, it's more of a dedicated Assassin ability. Yeah. And I, I could, even though Garrett even though Garrett does not kill, I could see, I could see that, I could see that because um, he's he is doubling and tripling down on st on stealth as well as um, having a bunch of trick arrows. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's also the same thing with Solid Snake. Solid Snake is another one that's very, very close to that. Mm -hmm. um, Marshall. Um. Once again, like I said, a lot of time we we go, we refer to aliens, but a marshal is someone like he's the lieutenant, he's Sergeant Apone, uh, not not Lieutenant Gorman, but Sergeant Apone is definitely the person who's on the field with people. Ripley is a bit Ripley has has a, a lot of that, but Marshall is your leader is your leader ability, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we look at you know, I look at aliens, we look at Predator uh, as as kind of these parables, these military roles. Um, Marshall is is your leader. Uh, they're the people that that kind of dictate. So a lot of times in command units, they're they're the Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger is probably the marshal in Predator. Yeah, and um, it is it is kind of amusing that I've I've seen so many people so many people on the third party end of the D twenty bubble, um, trying to trying to carry over the Warlord in so, in some capacity. Which yeah. really shows that the warlord scratched an itch that people didn't know they had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's that's one thing I kind of miss about. Um, sorry about that. Uh, one thing I miss about Ultra Modern Four moving into uh, we've got sorry sorry well, fourth edition into fifth edition was the the absence of that leadership character that we uh, that I really kind of appreciated the idea of a class that's all about. Uh, and I think this might be due to this reasoning of going back to the selfishness of player characters. Third edition, second edition, and fifth edition, it was definitely about I, me, myself. You know, even though we're a party of five people, uh, we're not friends. We're not getting along. We don't have that cohesiveness. I'm a rogue. I'm doing this. I, I'm selfish. I do my own thing. I'm a fighter. I do this. I'm a I'm a cleric. I want to do give give out this like and somehow only for the through the sheer will of a gr of of a group dynamic, these people are somehow uh, uh, journeying together, um, uh, you know, which is kind of ludicrous. And I was saying, no, 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 we're, we're going to make it. We're going to make the tech and classes, the tech, the sci-fi classes, very much classes that are based around teamwork. And and having a marshal on there was absolutely critical to that. Yeah. I have I have noticed a handful of people trying to trying to bring back the the concept of um your of you're working as a t you're work, you're supposed to be working as a team yeah uh, especially because let's consider the let's consider the cliche the whole you meet in a tavern you've known each other for years well if you've known each other for years you should be, you should be acting like a group instead of, instead of a bunch of individuals yeah that was always the voice that was always a problem with all. You know, uh, people have said there's been some controversy when you're a GM, when you're seeing the players. Because I have a couple rules when I start a game, and nobody has I've ever played with have ever objected to this. But when I've had conversations with people online, some people go, "Oh my God, that's a horrible way." And I, and I, I say, you know, you can't bring your characters over. If you're if you're in my game, you're starting. You're creating somebody new. That's one of my rules. Second rule: you make your character with everybody else. So everybody makes their characters at the, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Two: we all kind of know each other, unless there's something within the story where the GM specifically doesn't want the group together. And then my final one is that you have to you have to justify why you guys are together, and that's a big one. Because for because I I because it's not one of those situations where I lead by example. I've had the issue. Where I've had group dynamic get in, and then I, 
even though my in this, in this campaign the players specifically did not know each other the characters did not know each other and part of that game was bringing them all in one spot but i did not create the rule i go by the way you guys will have to get along so design your characters in such a way where you will and i didn't and we created chaos because the group were filled with selfish characters that did not want to deal with one another and that was always something that uh, always bothered me so i always make that rule i said you know and i have another rule which i enforce most of the time was which is you have to be heroes you don't necessarily have to be lawful good but i'm not here to role play with people who want to be assassins who want to just destroy the world i'm not interested in running a chaotic evil or lawful evil or neutral evil uh, group because at the end of the day it just turns into complete chaos yeah and with that with that in mind i'd, li I'd like to sh shift into the martial artist uh, yeah martial artist is that's that's my that's my matrix that's my kung fu doing everything to try to create modern martial artists without having to lean in on the wushu um stereotype uh, so going into all the modern Donnie Yen, Jackie Chan, modern action stories when where you know like like uh, you know especially Donnie Yen the the, mo the modern Donnie Yen uh, you know I can't remember the films that were that were really pushing me about uh, you know inspiring but he did he had a whole bunch of like modern crime films that he was doing where. He there's it was like modern crime and then you know and then massive amounts of action because he would have uh, you know you know not so so not trying to do it man and it man is is not wushu it's period piece but there is a slight um, exaggeration of how the attacks and you know but he did this film called Flashpoint uh, which is a fantastic movie that also stars uh, Colin Chow and so forth. And that one's really, really solid. He did another one where I'm trying to remember where. Um, oof, it's gonna get me. Try to figure this one out, but I know that uh, Flashpoint's from 2007, and that was that was a big inspiration. The idea of trying to create modern martial artists without leaning in on the crouching tiger, hidden dragon thing. Um, you keep saying. Do you mean Wusha? Because you keep saying Wushu, which is. I Say Wusha, yeah. Sorry, Wusha, yeah. The, the 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 really exaggerated uh, martial artists that we you know that we also love. I love it for its own place, but the monk fills that role in, in nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, although I I will say that, that I think I think the martial artist does a better job of em of emulating the fact that there are mul that there are a wide variety of different um, styles. Yeah, yeah, there's, and that's the thing is that with the archetypes, there's a whole bunch of different paths you can take in order to um, to change things, in order to make your character unique. Yeah, and I've, I've often had the joke of responding to the I know Kung Fu by saying, okay, which one? Yeah. Because <laughs> ser seriously, there's there's like 1,500 different, ver different versions, and those are the ones we know about. Yeah. There's, pro there's probably a bunch of sub of subversions within e within each of those yeah um and I'm, and though i do though of of course i do appreciate that um in in between that you have you have it that um you can either go with a dex build or a, or a strength build because well the stand the standard monk is ju is just dex but when you look at cert when you look at martial arts styles, what's dexterous about, say, Sambo? Yeah. Uh, what's what is what's dex? I would I would strongly hesitate to look at say Savat as de as um a dexterity based fighting style as well. Yeah, no, exactly right. Um, and definitely not with Muay Thai because well, <laughs> Muay Thai is all about breaking you. Yeah, exactly. Now, we, there's one of the archetypes that allows you to pick specific uh, uh, fields of, of expertise, and then that gives you some specific abilities. Of course, they have to be very vague. You know, I can't make it as that, that as specific as players would like by like going into specific moves, because then I'd, I'd have to make an entire book of just that. Mm -hmm. So, then there... We already talked about it a bit, but then... The, Next on the list is the medic. 
Yeah, medic is uh you is inspired by Vancian magic and the cleric uh, class, but is entirely based around medical uh, procedures, P keeping people alive, healing them, but also giving them boosts and so forth. Laying expertise. Um, there's also uh, a scientific level. So if you're if you're into the sciences, you get to do that with the medic as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, and then there's the sniper. Sorry, sniper. Like sniper, yeah. The basically the, the, that, that's and that's all the, the that's our that's our ranged rogue. The idea of once again, he, he yeah yeah he can do a lot of damage, but he is primarily designed to to really mess up single targets one on one, and that's kind of what his is is dealing is is attacking with a weapon and either doing massive amounts of damage or inflicting uh, huge uh, debuffs in order to um, uh, to kind of cripple an enemy. Yeah, I do remember I do remember playing. It. I do remember playing a sniper that um, was loosely inspired by the White Death. Uh, if you're if you're familiar familiar with that story from the, from um, from the from the Russell Russell Finland Wars. Mm. Um, his, the big the um, but the big thing with him is that is that for one we were doing this in a bit of a modern setup and. Which meant I could use set, I could use somewhat modern weapons, but um, find way, but find ways to make them ridiculous because they were f up against monsters. Mm -hmm. The approach I took was that he managed to create a semi-automatic version of the Fat Mac, <laughs> which okay. which the Fat Mac is absolutely ridiculous is an absolutely ridiculous rifle that is somehow legally considered a hunting rifle. Okay. And let let me let me see if I can get let me see if I can get you a ah uh, here here we go let me show I will send you the, I will send you this image just so you have an idea on what on what it is oh yeah okay yeah yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we we have those types of guns in the yeah. game yeah. It is. It's. It is not using normal ammo. It is using 950 JDJ, which is about, which is significantly thicker than, say, 30 out six. Yeah. Uh, and the the idea I had with him is his is he just he just sits he just sits back and 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 um, and fires fires at the right spot. The running gag was he is not kill stealing. He is kill confirming. Exactly. Because everybody was like, "Why? Why did you? St I had, I had, I had him. Why did you? Why did you steal my kill? I didn't steal it. I confirmed it." Uh -oh. Yeah, and we better make sure he's. You better make sure he's dead. Well, it's the reason you always check the body. It's also the reason you never, ever, 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 ever taunt the monster. Especially if you're in a hor especially if you're in a horror campaign, because the monster might just be playing possum. Exactly. You know, double tap is a thing, but the last on the list when it comes to the classes would be the techie. Yeah, that's our engineer. Mm -hmm. But uh, we wanted to have some fun, and we wanted to be given the capacity of sabotaging. He's he can be the demolitionist. He can be the person that uh, disarms explosives, sets explosives, and he can also put a, a a magic red button on on his gun, which was kind of our the most far fetched thing we ever did was putting the magic red button on your gun. Mm -hmm. uh, which I and I do I do appreciate that because the because when you say when you say that it's that he's the engineer, there's a lot of different ways you can go about that. Yeah. I mean, you could do you could do the engineer set setting up setting up def setting up defensive um, bot bots a la the engineer in Team Fortress Two, right. or or you or you could be the or you could be a more offensive affair. Uh, although I although you def I can definitely tell you had fun when it came to some of the names of class features like calling it the calling one of them Magai something. Yeah, well, there's one of those situations where. Uh... Because we're a universal system, I'm not beholden to not make fun of the system. So there's constantly the Ultimate Modern Five is full of pop culture references as we connect up to 
movies, video games, TV shows. And that's something that that's a staple of the of uh, the book. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to when it comes to lat when it came to the ladder system, um, I could see some people making some analogy between that and and race, but and and race systems, except. You end you end up um, you end up solving one. There's one issue that's in a lot of games that use races that isn't present here, and that is, it actually matters beyond first level. Uh, yeah. So, I didn't eliminate the the use of a species system. Mm -hmm. You can still have that selection in your game. Amethyst can do. Yeah, yeah. You can still pick if you wanted to be. If this was a setting that had elves or aliens. But what the ladder system was, was a direct adaptation of the D20 Modern system. The D20 Modern, the way they worked it, which was definitely, it was definitely a series of choices. They you At first level, you pick a type of hero that you want to be. And it's based off of the attribute that you want to focus the most on. You're the dexterous hero, the strong hero, the smart hero, and so forth. And then around second level, you got to choose a prestige class. And your prestige class was your actual class, the thing that was that defined you. So starting a D20 modern game at first level was actually a colossal bore because you were so underpowered, you were basically useless. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, generally you would design the characters at second or third level. Some, where they had some teeth to them. They had something to define them to make them unique. Now, uh, I didn't want to do that in that capacity, so instead... We create this ladder system, and what the ladder system does, it gives you an ability at first level, which is not game-breaking, because most of the time it's an alteration to something that's existing, primarily shifting your primary attribute of something. So, for example, you can use dexterity for certain firearms. You can use wisdom for firearms. You can use you know, dexterity for certain types of melee weapons. And all, all it does is, is swap out your attack attribute or your skill attribute to specialize in certain things. So it's it's not game breaking at all. It simply moves your attribute bonuses around. Mm -hmm. And then when you reach a level where you can either do the ability score modifier or uh, pick a feat, you can instead pick uh, a ladder ability, which is themed along the same path. Now what makes this a little differently is that the ladder ability, it itself is not more powerful. It's about the same level of balance, but if you pick that ladder feature more and more, you will get progressively more powerful ladders, and you have to buy them in sequence. So if you if you decide, you know what, I'm going to pick a feat or I'm going to pick up this ability, you'll never get to that last um, uh, ladder ability. And so if you do straight ladders, then yeah, they will get progressively more powerful, but not to the point of, I think, game-breaking. But that's what we did. We created this thing. So in many ways, when you pick a ladder, you could pick the first ladder uh, ability and then never ever refer to your ladder abilities from that point on. You can ignore them and just refer to your class abilities or feats or what have you and then never go back to it. But it gives you a new variety. Instead of having going, I can choose a feat, I can choose uh, an ability score modifier, or I can choose my ladder. So now we get, we've given you another option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when it comes to mag when it comes to magic, I do I do appreciate that that while it, while it could be tempting to just use the Vancian model all over again, you instead have the dark system, which has its own approach. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that one was a bit weird. I've since said I've made four very different spellcasting systems. Now, I made one for each of the each of the affinity books. So Conestoga, Taurus, and Paradise each have their own unique magic system. Amethyst now has a very unique amethyst magic system. But I wanted to create things that even if they had names of spells, we still moved away from that Vancian model. And I wanted to do something that was techno magic because Amethyst had a techno magic spell system in place before I introdu introduced disruption and threw that system out. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I had all these notes in place and I used those notes to create um, uh, a, a magic system. And then just for the hell of it, I decided to add a new attribute modifier, something called Vigor. And that was just, that was that one shtick. So that was the only cla only magic system I've ever designed that actually uses a, a, a new attribute, and then there are skills attached to that attribute, and certain things will work away. It was it was an experiment, and like I said it, the, the other cool thing about it is that it it it, was, it it integrated with technology, so you could have like a third arm that was attached to a backpack that would use that would do all the somatic hand movements, so you didn't have to. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. The the big th- the big thing that I that I found interesting with within it was um was the was the path system that's present. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so the path system were was um, basically allowed you to focus on one ability, and as you got better in one ability, you could pick other ones as well. And so there were paths that had synergy. Like uh, I said, trying things because a the other issue is that none of these magic systems I wanted to create were ever going to be as big as the player's handbook spell casting system. Because remember, that takes up a third of that book, right? Mm-hmm. And so. I'm on a very tight timeline when it comes to my budget, comes to that sort of thing, so I can never make my magic system as big as that. Ironically, the magic system in Amethyst is pretty big. But as a result, each of these paths only has like seven or eight abilities. And so as you go through it, you have the capacity of of making one ability better and better and better, or you can dive into multiple abilities. You can, there's a lot more special, specialization involved. Mm-hmm. Oh. But now, and with within the, with, it's funny that you bring it's funny that you bring up specialization because one one of the big one I remember ha- I remember it from day one having issues with the idea of each class having its own spell list, and the big the big reason I had that issue is once again, I know I bring it I know I've brought it up many times, but future proofing. Yeah, because. When you in, when you have that, and then you introduce a new a new spell through an expansion, now you have to waffle about what's what class is going to get it and at what and at what level is it treated. Yeah. Whereas with something like a path system, if it, all you'd have all that one would have to do is just just say, oh, okay, he, okay, here's the path that it's in, here's the tier that it's in, done. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those situations where that being said. I don't really think about future proofing. Like when I make a magic system, I don't think I better prep this thing for an expansion down the road. I generally write these things not thinking that there's going to be something that's going to modify it. Like I'll I'll probably never ever ever return back to the vigor system. I'd rather create new things. And you might you might not, but it's inevitable that somebody's going to homebrew it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that that is that is the other end of the future proofing. I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of getting at. There you go. Oh, cuz and yeah, yeah, pe- yeah, people will f- people will find a way around it, but it's but it but um it's better to put less obstacles in front of them when they do. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. For this for the same re- for the same reason I've al- I've always <clears throat> I've always I've always advocated giving so- giving some bit of advice when it comes to say mo- say monster or antag- or antagonist creation when po- when possible. Yeah. Because you can put you could put hundreds or thousands of monsters in a monster manual. You no campaign is going to use all of them. Yeah. And eventually the ones that fit are going to run thin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just just ha- and just saying, "Oh, just mo- just modify what's already there." That's um My philosophy has always been house ruling should be a spice. And yeah. And last I checked you're you're not going you're not going to bury you're not going to bury a dish in a in a full container's worth of oregano, for instance. <laughs> no, exactly right. Oh, not unless you have the worst taste buds in the universe, which in that case you've got bigger problems. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but and I I now shifting shifting into the modules because for the cam- for the campaign, um, you had put you had put you've put in that that there's going to be qu- there's going to be a few um di- a few different modules um at added to added to it so so a good chunk of those I'd like to kind kind of dip into the first being um the clonefall adventure yeah so four of these adventures are being written by uh my co-writer uh, William Miller mm-hmm. and then I am handling the two campaign settings so two four of them are adventures two of them are campaign worlds mm-hmm. Uh, Clone Fall is one of William's adventures, and that one is something. That one, uh, when it comes to the creation process, Echoes of Noah ninety four and a few others are much more well developed. Clone Fall is still in the design process. I do know it's going to be a heist story, but other than that, I don't actually know the full details on that one. Other than the fact that it's going to be cyberpunk and might be slightly 
even though it's cyberpunk, it, there might be a level of post-apocalyptic cyber, cyberpunk to it. Uh, and William has yet to, sh- to share with me the details on that. So I'm actually still waiting for to see what that one's going to be about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what I know, I know that he had, I know that he had written, he, he had written most of the adventures, but what could you tell me about, um, Echoes of Noah 94, for instance? Well, Echoes of Noah 94 came out of the fact that I, I had him over one time, and we, and we watched the film Pandorum, and we're both big, big fans of that one. I was a, already a big fan, he became a big fan, and so we liked the idea of creating an adventure that was kind of a psychological horror story that is set on a giant colonizer ship, mm-hmm. where you're, you're potentially... Uh, years from your destination, years from home, and Hull was lost because Earth is destroyed behind you. And then you're stuck on this ship where things start to go wrong. Things start breaking down, and you have to explore the ship, get to the reactor core, fix the reactor, go to certain places on the ship to do small tasks, and make sure the ship gets to its destination on time. Uh, Ironically, the board game Nemesis took that same idea and ran with it, so we're taking that same inspiration from Pandorum and going in a different direction. Mm Mm-hmm. And it is it is kind of it is kind of it's kind of amusing that so so many people took have taken inspiration from that film despite how despite the film not doing well at the box office. Well, what annoys me the most about it is so many people think it's an alien ripoff and go just. And I was making a case in a video I did for Dice Tower where it says like, you know. We're going to stifle truly original and innovative ideas if you keep on saying that if you're 10% similar to this one thing, then you're obviously ripping it off. And there's this level of tribalism going on with people, especially you know more now than ever, where I like this thing and therefore I love this thing. And because I love this thing, anything that comes close to it is ripping it off and I will defend it to death. And I'm like... Dude, nobody's on your side. You're look, you're making a fool out of yourself. And I've, I've had to butt heads with, with people just recently with this campaign. When people will look at an illustration and say, "Hey, are you are you you're ripping off this guy," and I said, "I'm ripping off that guy," and they're like, "Yeah, you're ripping off that guy." I go, "That that 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 illustration's four years newer than ours. Our illustration's from 2018. This guy's from 2023. How are we ripping him off?" Mm-hmm. And these people don't accept that as an answer. They they just don't answer because they're like, "Oh, I made my statement. I'm not going to bother commenting because I look like an idiot." But the number of times I've had to deal with that is is just it's very very frustrating that type of that type type of tribalism. So I think that, uh, yeah, I've always been a fan of the space uh, horror setting. I love Alien. I love any, even the ones that were direct Alien ripoffs. I like them to a small degree. But to say that because we have Alien, we can't have any other horror stories set in space. Like, what do you, we, you know, we have Psycho. We're allowed to have other films about serial killers. I mean. We're allowed to have other films of this genre, and I feel I feel it's very frustrating that the idea of a monster in space story is owned, such a generic term is owned wholly by one specific IP. It's very, very disappointing with people I that think, think that. that. It, I think anyone who has who has that attitude has never has never done anything has never done anything creative. Well, you look at the reviews for Nemesis, and you look at the negative reviews for Nemesis. They all talk, start talking about its IP theft, and they should sue them. And like you know, and the funny thing is. None of these people have seen Pandorum. And I've said the fact that, is Nemesis a ripoff of Alien? And the people go, yes. I go, no, it's not a ripoff of Alien. Because if you look at the game of, of what Nemesis is, every single plot point it has at no point is similar to Alien. It's ripping off Pandorum. But since nobody's seen Pandorum, nobody knows it. And that's why I say someone's like, oh, Nemesis is a ripoff of Alien. That's not. It's a ripoff of Pandorum. Well, if I'm being honest, the... The no the notion of the notion of ripoff has been severely flanderized. Oh yeah, the it's it's the, the ripoff is is like the literary version of the term woke. It's been used so much, it's been abused, and it's been corrupted by morons. So now it's it's lost all meaning. Yeah. Um, just just in, just as one just as one example in in the video game space, um, I rem- I. I remember when the phrase "Doom Clone" was all over the place. Oh yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. Even, even though, and it, e- I even, even to the point of of people applying that to the holy trinity of build engine games, with, i.e., um, Duke Nukem, Shadow Warrior, and Blood. Uh, yeah. Even though, even though, um, 
all three, even though all three of those games aren't do aren't doing this aren't doing the same things as Doom Two, and in fact, th in fact, the build engine for as um for as unstable as it could be at times was was seen as a massive step forward in terms of interactivity. Right. And um, you definitely can't ha you definitely can't take the same strategies that you would in Doom Two and apply them to Blood unless you like to die very very quickly. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. That, that's it, it's it's funny the fact that what what happens is after a while they they once there are enough things in that genre, then it starts becoming a, like for example, it's there were so many Doom clones that came out, and so much time passed that eventually they just called it a a Twitch shooter, right? And now we have we have dozens and dozens of games in that same genre as Doom, but now we call them it's like the the deck building mechanic from board games. We had Dominion, then there were a thousand variations, so we became the deck building mechanic. No one calls it, no one says they're ripping off Dominion anymore because it's it's entered the zeitgeist. And so it, it comes frustrating when when something has entered the zeitgeist and people go, "Well, you're ripping off that." I mean, I have people go who who still say to me that um, Amethyst rips off Shadowrun. And I said, "Have you read Amethyst?" And then, no, and at no point does anyone ever say, "Well, no, I haven't." I go, "Well, then, how do you know?" It's because it's elves and cyberpunk. I go, "Really?" Because there's no cyberpunk in my setting. So where did you get the idea that I was cyberpunk? No, it's elves in a science fiction setting. I go, "So why why isn't Warhammer 40k a ripoff of Shadowrun?" And of course, you can't make that argument because for Warhammer 40k came up before Shadowrun. But you you don't make that argument because that's not how their brain thinks. And it, it, it gets frustrating. So someone says, well, no, they're allowed to have that. I go, well, what about Star Wars? Star Wars is fantasy. Why uh, is, 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 is uh, Spock not an elf-like creature? <laughs> and, and, and the more, the more they, they start trying to go, no, yeah, but it has orcs and all that stuff. I go, yeah, but I have, a di I have the disruption mechanic, which means those worlds don't mix. What I'm doing is creating a situation where the Tolkien-like fantasy world it invades our modern world and disrupts its existence so you can have one and the other. It's post-apocalyptic fantasy, right? And the funny thing is is that there have been story shows and TV shows that have come out later that have leaned in on this. And so whenever someone still says, and t people are accusing, that they're looking at the image uh, on the advertising on Backer Kit. They look at the, at the tagline and say, well, this is a Shadowrun ripoff. And we say, it's a universal system of rules. Yes, you can do Shadowrun. You could also do a hundred different settings. Mm -hmm. So how is it a ripoff of Shadowrun? It's, it's like GURPS is a ripoff of Star Wars. GURPS, you could do anything you want with GURPS. It's not a ripoff of anything. It's a universal system. Yeah. Uh, what I, that's the reason why I, why I say that a lot of people who make those arguments have never done, have never done a creative endeavor because everybody, ta everybody takes inspiration from something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and tr truth be told, it's finding the chain of events that led to, that led to a creation that is something I always find fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, now I, I know it was I know it was dipped into during that live stream, but um, as I understand it, the ne the next one on the list, Madness at the Megalomart, was built on the idea of taking the um, hold hold up in a mall motif that's seen in so that's seen in so many zombie films, and instead instead of Instead of dealing with zombies, you're de you're in a mart um, dealing with um, hell. Yeah. So I think Willie, Willie and I have have two different concepts, and I'm hoping that we're going to incorporate them both. His was trying to do a, a takeoff of the Army of Darkness idea, and I like the idea of of of, of um, playing off of the idea of sending a Walmart to hell. And then having to use everything in the Walmart at your disposal to fight off the uh, the the creatures and the manifestations of hell, and I think I guess hopefully we'll get to a but that's the common thing. Ultimately, it doesn't deal with the fact that um, this Walmart basically or this big box retailer uh, suddenly turns into this this image of hell. But I do like the idea of this thing being transported to hell, and you have to leave the the, the Walmart in order to find the tools in order to send your Walmart back to the real world. But and meanwhile, the Walmart is being assaulted, and so it's, it's, there's a lot of really goofy things. It's definitely very tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm. Now, of, now the next one I wanted to ask is on um, Phantom Stage. Yeah, so Phantom Stage is Weird West. I think it I, the push is that it's not steampunk because I've done steampunk, and Phantom Stage is definitely pushing on the Weird West uh, genre. And I'm looking forward to seeing. I know it's 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 inspired by this one idea, uh, which is entirely a true story. So there's this town uh, near where I live called Barkerville. It's one of those historical 
uh, towns, the 1800 Gold Rush. Uh, there's a few of them in the States, but uh, Barkerville is probably the most well-known in Canada. Mm-hmm. And the irony, of course, is that it was like, oh, from the 1800s. It's like, yeah, actually, most of the buildings are from the 1950s because there were a couple of really big fires and virtually none of the buildings are standing. Not only that, but there have been also been numerous mudslides because Barkerville is basically on a, on a, on a, on a hillside, a hillside with a lot of mud and dirt. And so mud constantly flows down from the uh, upper hills. And so Barkerville also gets continuously buried and they're constantly um, <clears throat> raising the foundations of these buildings. And in some situations, they haven't bothered. Mm-hmm. And uh, th- as they explain to the fact that the real Barkerville is actually underneath them because there's almost an entire town that's buried beneath them. Uh, specifically, for example, the, ho- uh, the big uh, uh, let's see, hotel, their big theater, um, the bottom level of the theater was the main level of the, of the theater uh, 100 years ago. And it was basically mudslides buried it so much that they just built a new theater on top of the old one. So the basement is actually the main floor of 100 years ago, and there's now a new theater on top of it. And this is not the only case. There's actually several situations that if they, if they did like a sonograph of Barkerville, you would see an entire town buried underneath it. And so we took that idea and say, what would happen if something started happening and there were ghosts and demonic presences within that buried town that started to ooze to the surface and then people on the surface trying to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And now when, now when it comes to the campaigns, the first one I wanted to ask on is the Retroverse Chronicles. Yeah, that was another one where we're having conversation with people or looking at the one photo and assuming what it is. And there is some inspiration, but um, it was based off of the idea I've always wanted to try. I, I love the just the juxtaposition of genres mm-hmm. is taking something that's old and turning it to sci-fi. Steampunk is one. I love Art Deco. I love Atomic Punk. Uh, big fan of Art Deco. Uh, I like Diesel Punk as well. I'm not a huge fan of, of the punk term. I've had issues with the fact that everyone is insisting on on labeling and categorizing every single type of fiction as being a punk, and it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, like you know, this is uh, this is Atomic Punk. I mean, no, it's not. It's Art Deco. But no, thanks for calling. Like my I, when like my Taurus book, for example, mm-hmm. I would say it's steampunk. It's easy to convey as being steampunk. It's a trigger word that people like. Oh, steampunk! And then I go, aha! It's actually not steampunk. It's it's a uh, it's a weird West Art Deco, and it has steampunk elements, but it's actually three different genres in one. But people won't know that. They'll look at it and they'll go, oh, it's steampunk. I go, really? Because it's not Victorian, and there's actually no steam in the setting. But it, people don't know what else to say, so they'll say steampunk, even though what it is, it's actually Art Deco in Weird West. Um, and uh, so, so retroverse is part of that idea, that 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 juxtaposition, that's flipping up on the genre, taking something that's futuristic and taking it to the past in some kind of alternate reality. We've seen a bunch of these. There's been a couple of video games. Uh, I remember playing with the old PS1. There was a video game or a PS2 which was taking Mecca and taking it to World War II. There's a couple video games. Uh, there was one for PlayStation 1. I can't remember the name. Uh, I have one on my Steam right now, which is that same thing. It's uh, where the mechs were, were called mobile trenches. And so they were like walking versions of trenches that would move forward. And uh, it was very much, once again, a World War II. And people say, oh, it's steampunk. Like, no, it's not. It's kind of very diesel punky. Uh, and I like that just position. Um, Scythe, which is a very popular board game, is done, uh, which is basically inspired by this, p- this painter named Jacob, oh God, Kozalski. He's a um, uh, he's a very interesting artist. And the hilarious thing is that uh, Jacob Rosalski, Riz- Jacob Rosalski, that's the guy's name. He, he he was the one who was who was adding in Mecca to old communist communism uh, propaganda posters. Mm-hmm. And it was it was very very popular. And he sold the rights to to a video game called Iron Harvest. Mm-hmm. and to a board game with Scythe. The irony, of course, is that he has been accused of plagiarism because the original illustrations that he was using, he, in many ways, was literally copy-pasting these illustrations over to his own uh, format and then adding the mecha to it. So in some situations, he wasn't contributing much to it. Uh, then you have uh, Simon Stahlberg, who, cro- who wrote uh, uh, Tales, Tales from, from the Loop, yeah, Tales from the Loop. and uh, The Electric State. 
But once again, it's the same type of that juxtaposition, taking something futuristic and taking it to the past. And for him, it was like the it was like the '90s, uh, late '80s, early '90s in Sweden. He was playing off of that. Uh, the Electric State does the same thing as well. I don't know if it, how the Electric State, but he, he likes playing off of that idea. And I'm a big fan of alternative ways of of civilization collapsing. The idea of nuclear weapons doesn't interest me. I like stories where there's a collapse of civilization where nuclear weapons or 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 viruses were involved. It was something else, something interesting. And so I started playing off the idea of um, <clears throat> what if a rampant, uncontrolled technological progress in an era where mankind couldn't actually really understand the implications of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, how could how could that do it? And so the idea is that right around the, the end, the beginning of the uh, and the end of the industrial revolution, the beginning of the information age, 1940s, 1930s, um, we got access to extremely high technology in an era where we were still very tribal, very warlike, like like we, like we are a lot more now, but we don't have access to the internet, we don't have access to the interconnectivity, and seeing how society starts to break down with these high-tech items kind of invading our life. Um, and then I wanted the I wanted Retroverse to be as very much an art piece, and so I've been talking with Nick uh, Greenwood, the artist, about how we want to convey it, uh, and there's a part of me that wants to turn Retroverse into a narrative art book role-playing game hybrid where it tells a very detailed story nick's art is huge it's brilliant it's massive and maybe 10 percent of it is actually rules but more it's it's more a journey into this world that we're creating mm -hmm. yeah that's actually part of a series that i want to dive into which i call uh, ruin rose ruin rose and uh, it, it there, there are three types of there are three stories that have very similar things in common kind of what i did with affinity but different yeah. Uh, where they had certain common plot threads. Uh, there's another one I want to write called Dream of the Tempest that, once again, shares a lot of ideas with Retroverse. Mm -hmm. But the idea being that this is going to be a, a, a very a very bizarre kind of post-apocalyptic setting. Uh, what the interesting thing is that I had a bunch of ideas and then I read, I read The Electric State and I went, ah, crap, I have to think of something a bit more original because he was playing on some of the same ideas I was playing with, so I was a bit upset by that. So I got to try something else and, and hopefully we'll, we'll make it nice and original. Um, it's funny when you bring up the juxtaposition because I recall I recall coming across a, a set of a set of images that if if um if nobody if it if nobody can build upon this into into a video game then I would pr I would probably try and build upon this in tape in tabletop form. Mm -hmm. um, there was a series of concept art series of concept images and I just sent you the link to the related album by Gregory Fermento. Who's one? Who's the art director at Behavior Interactive? Um, yeah. Who and has done work for Ubisoft and a bunch of other people. But what I see in what I see in this is a juxtaposition where you have where you have cars that are of the modern world, but the world itself isn't. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is exactly what I'm talking about. And the funny thing is, is that he's probably he's probably fielding accusations from people saying you're ripping off Simon Stahlberg. It's more a part of that that tribal loyalty from people that just do reflex actions and want to, they and they want to be able to say that this is a rip off to make themselves feel better. Uh, and what I what I see out of what I see out of this is um, is I'm envisioning um am, have you have, are you familiar at all with the need for speed games? Uh, you should, you should see what I drive in my daily life. <laughs> oh, because I'm I'm imagining. But yes, I do. I'm imagining that, but in but in a in 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 say the city that was depicted in Half Life Two. Oh. of course, one of the one of the bigger images that that ended up that ended up sticking in my mind is the drag race image at the bo at the bottom of what looks like. Two two cars doing a standard drag race, but it's on a it's on a derelict aircraft carrier. Yeah, I, yeah, like I said, I'm I'm definitely going to be um, l l l looking at this guy. This is actually very very cool, mm -hmm. really, very very cool. I, I won't keep on looking at it, but they're definitely very cool. I'm going to I'm going to take a look at these later. Yeah. But yeah, that's exactly my point. Is is carrying on that just position where we have this kind of super advanced black technology. Um, but you have something that's modern as well. Because mm -hmm. whenever whenever you're dealing with advanced tech in a science fiction setting, um, 
it is it is still important to make to give it some sort of connection to what people are actually seeing and yeah. that that applies with both science fiction and that applies with technology and with um aliens mm -hmm. like i i remember i remember having a whole having a whole ass rant about the about about the alien in um star trek 4 about how, about how it how so much of it has no real analog to really make sense which is and its fixation on whales is even it makes things even more ridiculous yeah i mean the film isn't isn't taking itself seriously so it's got that yeah. it's got that going for it but mm -hmm. it is one of those things where i can't unsee it yeah and now with th with um threshold that is that is I'm guessing that's where you really leaned into Pandorum. Uh, no, actually. Um, but can we put that on hold for one second? I have to move my car. Is that okay? We can take a quick two-minute break. Yeah. So Threshold started off. Uh, you have to go back to the mid '90s. I love once again the space horror genre, Alien, and so forth. So I dis uh, to, uh, kind of conceived this setting where characters would be. Uh, salvage crew uh, our salvage crew of a spaceship that are going around and finding space wrecks and then the adventures would be finding unique stories in every one of these space wrecks and having interesting encounters um, each time and I created this big story, big background and I called it Pathfinder this was early 90s and the hilarious thing is a lot of people uh, would look at this this website later and go Wow, did you ever think you wanted to, to sue Joss Whedon for Firefly? Like, no, it's pure coincidence. Just this setting just kind of looked like Firefly. Um, you know, I made mine in '94, '95, uh, and we didn't see uh, Firefly till I think 2001. So uh, I kind of forgot about it, and then a few years ago, I dusted off some of the core ideas. And so what Threshold is, is just an expansion of this idea in a new setting. The idea that something has happened, which has resulted in the, in the vanishing of a huge amount of the population of the human empire. There are no evidence that there's no other alien empires around. And so this old, these old, this old colony is heading back to the inner colony world, finding them all abandoned. And the only way for them to kind of pick up the pieces is to recover these old space wrecks visiting these abandoned colonies and finding out what's actually happened. So Threshold is very much a campaign guide. It's about traveling to different worlds and um, finding these space wrecks. There's a, there's a modular dungeon map system within it. And so you basically create these dungeon maps and you it's almost like Space Hulk, but with a completely different setting around it. The idea of going through a, uh, going through a wreckage of a spaceship and having to clean it out of any infestations before you can try to sell it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's out of the it's it's peeled out of the 40k universe, but the idea is still kind of there. This idea of traveling through these randomly generated dungeon maps. Yeah, which is am amusing because some I remember somebody asking me why don't, why don't they just why don't they just blow up why don't they just blow up a space hulk if it's if it if if there's that much trouble in it. Blowing a space blowing up a space hulk is impossible. Or rather, or rather, the amount of work that it takes to do it is far too expensive to be worth it because of how many ships are just jammed are just jammed together in even one space hulk. Yeah. And same same thing with taking it apart. You'd have it would be. I would, I would say the closest Earth an, the closest modern analog to try, to trying to take apart a space hulk would be mm. trying to trying to would be the amount of time it took to, um. Sal salvage and move away the Costa Concordia when it when it um crashed into when it crashed into um that I that island off the coast of Italy mm -hmm. where it took yeah. it took it took like it took like two billion dollars just to set up everything so that they could get the thing upright and then move it out yeah and the whole process took years exactly. Plus, there's 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 always going to be people um, there's always going to be people doing doing salvaging or looking for hidden treasure. Even in modern day, even in the modern day, there's plenty of documentaries made about that whole thing. Oh. Yeah, and even even 
especially especially when it comes to say di say um ships that sa that sank to the bot that sank to the bottom of the ocean you're going to find plenty of t of teams trying to see what see what down there they can t they can grab either f either for historical purposes or for or for profit or sometimes both yeah exactly right uh, and i'm guess i'm guessing within that campaign you do ha you you do have a, you are going to have a means on randomly generating what's going to be inside ships yeah yeah we have a bunch of enemies and opponents uh, one's a canonical one, but you can actually play with whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So, with all, with all that with all that said, um, I do want I do want to first offer my congrats on how well on the fact that you managed to get um, full fu full funded and are and are going past that. Since mm -hmm. at the time of this recording, you were asking for thirty thousand. You're currently at thirty one point seven. Yep. So when it comes now, when it comes to when it, com when it comes to all when it comes to um the material invo involved, I'm guess I'm guessing that's I'm guessing that's going to be sp um spread out over a over a lengthy period. Well, like or I said, the Ultra Modern, of course, is uh, Ultra Modern is of course finished. Mm -hmm. So what we just need to do is um uh get that printed and then the adventures will be slowly spooled out um uh, i'm going to be doing threshold uh myself william's doing the other four echoes of no 94 or is written i think the other ones are in the planning stage so echoes of no 94 will be the first out threshold will be out in a, in a couple of months for a digital release uh it'll these all six of these will be slowly spooled out and released over the next eight to ten months yeah, and i i can i can certainly i can certainly get behind that yeah Oh. Now, for for those who are, for now with with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, my pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh man, I drank way too much yesterday. <laughs> and of, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> Bye.